In this video, I'm going to show how I built my Marx generator, which is a circuit that generates a pulse of super high voltage. The concept behind the circuit is actually really simple. A high voltage source charges up a bunch of capacitors in parallel through large resistors, and when they reach a certain threshold, an arc is formed in the spark gaps between them, and they're suddenly connected in series. The resistance of the arcs across the spark gaps is several orders of magnitude lower than the charging resistors, so for the short duration of the high voltage pulse, you effectively have a circuit where all the capacitors are just connected in series. In an ideal case, the voltage of the pulse will be the input voltage times the number of stages, so in this example we'd get 100,000 volts. This voltage is high enough to then arc across a much larger gap, producing the huge spark you saw at the start of the video. To generate the high voltage input, 12 volts is supplied to a ZDS circuit that drives a flyback transformer. This is the same circuit I used in my voltage multiplier video, except I had to rebuild the transformer after a little accident. The transformer puts out 10,000 volts AC, which is fed into a voltage doubler that also rectifies the current, giving me 20,000 volts DC. This doubler was placed in a 3D printed case and potted with polyester resin to keep the components from arcing to each other or to nearby objects. I fed the circuit 12 volts with my bench power supply and tested out the 20,000 volt output, which seemed to work without a problem. The next task was to build the Marx generator circuit itself. Because of the high voltages produced, it's a good idea for circuits like these to be vertical so that the point where the voltage is highest is farthest from the ground. This required me to build a small tower which consisted of lightweight truss segments that were 3D printed, and the whole thing ended up looking a lot like a miniature cell phone tower. I also wanted to raise the ground electrode higher up, so I 3D printed this little base for a 1 inch PVC pipe and zip tied the ground wire to it. The first test was done with an electrode gap of 7 inches. The circuit worked exactly as planned, but it looks like it killed my power supply in the process, or at least the chips that drive these displays. Something must not have been grounded right and backfed into the supply, so for the rest of the tests I just used a battery. The next big problem I ran into was that the capacitor leads would arc to each other at 20,000 volts, causing the circuit to not charge. To solve this problem, I printed some cases for the capacitors and filled them with hot glue, which should have a much higher breakdown voltage than air. I ran the next tests with an 8 inch gap. A simple lightning detector circuit with an antenna and an amplifier can detect lightning more than 50 miles away. These arcs are basically really tiny lightning bolts, so I wondered if I could sense them from across the garage. To find out, I hooked up a 24-inch antenna to my oscilloscope and ran the circuit. I started by taking measurements 8 feet from the base of the ground electrode. This approach proved to be surprisingly effective. At 8 feet away, the antenna recorded a peak voltage of 50 volts. The results were also surprisingly consistent. Three runs ran back to back looked nearly identical on the scope. The waveform that consistently appeared was this 50 volt spike for about 3 microseconds, followed by a sudden drop to around 20 volts and a smooth ramp down to about 0 volts in 200 microseconds. I suspect the second part wasn't from the arc itself, and probably from static charge on the antenna dissipating through the scope's 1 mega ohm probe. Next, I hooked up a 6 inch coil with 5800 turns to see if I could detect the magnetic field of the discharge. This is because any conductor, even an electrical arc, will cause a radial magnetic field around it. By placing a coil so that its area is perpendicular to the field lines, the rapidly changing field, caused by the rapidly changing current, will induce a voltage in the coil that should be picked up on the oscilloscope. So as you can see, there's also a detectable magnetic field from the discharge. 
The same is true of lightning in nature. These particular discharges range between 5 and 7 volts across the coil. Let's see what the discharge does to a light bulb. Okay, that was pretty cool, but I still have a problem with this circuit. It's not arcing as far as it could be. See, in theory the discharge voltage should be the input voltage times the number of stages, but when the spark gaps trigger on their own, that doesn't end up happening. So let's take a closer look at why. Let's ignore the spark gaps for a minute and just look at the resistor capacitor network the circuit is made up of. Because each capacitor has a resistor on both the high and low side, it effectively has a charging resistance of 2R. In the case of my circuit, that comes out to 1.76 mega ohms and 1 nanofarad. Now there's this thing called an RC time constant, which is the time it takes to charge a capacitor to 1 minus 1 over E times the input voltage, or about 63%. Each time constant adds a power to the exponent of E, meaning the capacitor initially charges really fast, but very quickly levels off. Here you can see that to charge from 86% to 98% takes three times as long as charging from 0 to 63%. So in the case of my circuit, the RC time constant of the first RC pair is just under 2 milliseconds. Seems pretty fast, right? But what about the next RC pair, and the one after that, and the final capacitor in the chain? The charge times get progressively longer. Now you might try to be clever and just add up all the RC time constants to figure out the time constant of the whole system, but this formula is actually invalid because even while the last capacitor is just barely beginning to charge, the first capacitor is still drawing a little bit of charge. Let's visualize this in a simulation. Here's my circuit without the spark gaps, and I'm going to show the difference in charge over time of the first capacitor versus the last capacitor. The red line is the first capacitor, and the green line is the last one. We're looking for the time it takes to get to 12.6 kilovolts, which is the charge level of one RC time constant here. It looks like that occurred at about 239 milliseconds, which is 136 times the RC time constant of the first capacitor. Wow. After doing a bunch of simulations and curve fitting the results in Excel, I got the formula shown in the upper left. What this graph shows is the number of RC time constants it would take for the very last capacitor in a chain to reach one time constant of charge. As you can see, adding stages increases that number exponentially. So why does that matter? It just means you need to wait longer and you still get your big spark, right? Well, not really. See, once the voltage across the first capacitor climbs high enough, it breaks down and triggers the rest of the chain. Problem is, the caps further down the chain aren't charged enough yet, so you get a situation where some of the spark gaps fire, do some sort of weird loop back through the circuit, and you never really reach full charge and get your big spark. The solution is to widen the first couple spark gaps just enough so that they're too far away to trigger at full charge. This will allow the whole chain to reach full charge, at which point you manually trigger the first gap and set off all of your capacitors at full voltage. Let's try that out. I've widened up the first couple spark gaps and increased my electrode distance to 9.5 inches. This approach was definitely more consistent and well controlled than letting the gaps just trigger automatically, but sometimes the gaps would fire and the arc wouldn't form. I think this is because the distance on the large gap was right on the edge, and if I didn't give the circuit time to charge to 100%, the gaps would just be set off and current would loop back through the chain. Overall, I think it worked pretty well as a first prototype. The circuit produced 320,000 volts at its peak and jumped an arc up to 9.5 inches long. The only thing that needs to be improved is the gap tuning and control. In the future, I plan to build a larger version capable of 1 to 2 million volts of output, so stay tuned for that.